Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Hotep, which in the language of ancient Egypt means we come with justice in peace. Welcome to Freedom Now, a Saturday Pan-Africanist and International World Affairs program. Freedom Now is committed to the principle of the rights of all peoples and nations to self-determination. We thank you deeply for your contribution to KPFK, which permits programs like Freedom Now to stay on the air. In this era of corporate acquisition and co-optation of all dissident media, we provide the microphone challenging their corporate and racist point of view. So stay tuned for agenda here at Freedom Now. Fellas, I'm ready to get up and do my thing. I want to get into it, man, you know. Hoteps and wisdom to all of our faithful and devoted listeners out there in the radio verse. This is Brother Brandon Zankara, and I want to start things off with a thank you to all of you listeners out there who continue to support Freedom Now. You keep us on our mission and allow us to bring you our agenda for today, Saturday, November 26, 2022. We begin with a relay from Prison Radio, bringing us a message from our dear brother behind the walls, Mumia Abu-Jamal, with something to say about the wisdom of France Fanon. After that, Dr. Gerald Horn will be in conversation with Jeremy D. Popkin, William T. Bryan Chair in History at the University of Kentucky at Lexington, and author of the book, Facing Racial Revolution, Eyewitness Accounts of the Haitian Insurrection. There is no revolution in the Western Hemisphere that compares to that of the Haitian Revolution, an event with no shortage of narratives written. Popkin, however, hoped to verify and find detailed first-hand accounts of this glorious event in African history, so you'll definitely want to hear about his findings. Next up, we go back to Prison Radio, ready to send us yet another relay, bringing us a message from Brother Ken Juan Congo Jr. with a commentary on the death of Queen Elizabeth and the legacy of imperialism throughout the Western world. After that, in the second half of our program, we'll be hearing from Professor Quito Swan, Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies at Indiana University at Bloomington. For our purposes today, Professor Swan is the author of the book, Pacifica Black, Oceana, Anti-Colonialism, and the African World. I have no doubt that this part of the diaspora is one that many of us have yet to truly explore, and Professor Swan will be dropping enlightening gems of wisdom onto Dr. Horn and to all of you out there, so be sure to stay tuned. Now I'm going to be on the ones and twos as we pour this knowledge, making sure your mental cup runneth over with revolutionary wisdom right here to quench your mental thirst on freedom now. KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles and KPFK.org streaming live on the web. And to make sure that we stay on a smooth ride with that cultural vibe that you know and love, we'll be enjoying a musical bottom featuring Gabor Bola, Lee Morgan, the Matt Kendrick Unit, Ron Carter, and Thelonious Monk. Now, people get ready for this train to come and taking you one step closer to mental liberation and stay tuned for a word from our dear brother Mumia Abu-Jamal, followed by a conversation with Dr. Gerald Horn and Professor Jeremy D. Popkin. of 
Franz Fenon. His name was Franz Fenon, born in Martinique, in the West Indies, 1925. At the time of his death, 36 years later, his words would inspire freedom movements around the world, and his ideas captured in his posthumously published book, The Wretched of the Earth, would become a classic selling over a million copies. Fanon was actually Dr. Franz Fanon, a psychiatrist who considered the vile system of colonialism a social pathology. Dr. Fanon worked with the FLN, National Liberation Front, of Algeria. It was an anti-colonial forces that fought against French imperialism there. He actually became the voice of Algerian national resistance and wrote pieces for the FLN journal, El Mujadi. He wrote searing, biting critiques of French political support for Algerian colonials and similar systems in black Africa. When Dr. Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale began to organize the Black Panther Party in 1966, Seale handed Newton a copy of Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. Newton reportedly read it six times. His ideas seeded the ideas that would later permeate the leadership and membership of the Black Panther Party. His general idea was that the colonized and the oppressed had to fight against their oppressors with every tool at their disposal. His words gave heft and weight to the Algerian Revolution, which triumphed after seven years of war. His writings continue to await after over half a century since his death in an American hospital. With love, not fear, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. <laughs> Gerald Moore for KPFK, kpfk.org, and with me on the line is Jeremy D. Popkin, William T. Bryan Chair in History at the University of Kentucky at Lexington, and author and editor of the book, Facing Racial Revolution, Eyewitness Accounts of the Haitian Insurrection. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. Professor Popkin. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. And thank you for joining us and thank you for accepting it. So why did you produce this book? I became interested in the uh, events that we call the Haitian Revolution about uh, 25 years ago now. I had read a very interesting historical novel by an author named Madison Smart Bell called uh, All Souls Rising. And uh, as a historian, I was, uh, I asked myself the question, uh, how many of the amazing events he describes uh, actually took place the way he described them? And in the course of uh, following up on that question, I discovered some of these first person accounts by people who had lived through those events and written about them at the time. I discovered that uh, Madison Smart Bell had used some of these as sources uh, but I became interested in looking for others, and uh, that got me into putting together a book uh, with uh, some of the most uh, striking passages from these accounts. Mm -hmm. So between 1791 and 1804, during what becomes known as the Haitian Revolution, were there U.S. nationals on the island, 
And if so, what did they have to say about what was going on? And were there accounts in U.S. periodicals about these events? Uh, there were quite a few Americans who were in what was then called the French colony of Saint-Domingue during these events. Uh, it was a very important uh, market for French, uh, for excuse me, for American uh, merchants throughout the period. And uh, American newspapers followed the events there uh, closely and published uh, a lot of uh, uh, news about them. Uh, I didn't uh, particularly uh, look for accounts by Americans, though. Uh, they were rarely directly confronted with the uh, violence of the uh, Haitian Revolution. Uh, the accounts I worked with were mostly by French uh, colonists, although some of them were first published later in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, who was Georges Biasso? Georges Biasso was one of the uh, early leaders of the uh, uprising by the enslaved uh, blacks in Haiti, along with uh, another uh, black leader named uh, Jean-Francois, and a lot of the uh, whites whose accounts I uh, excerpted uh, uh, personally met uh, Biasso and Jean-Francois and give us some of our most uh, vivid portraits of those black leaders. Now, I understand Biasu wound up spending time in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, another historian once referred to him as uh, the first man who ever uh, retired to Florida. <laughs> uh, like many of the uh, Black uh, participants in the insurgency, uh, he uh, joined the uh, Spanish army. And uh, after the Spanish uh, retreated from uh, Saint Domingue in 1795, uh, they took him to uh, Florida, and uh, he spent the uh, rest of his life there. Mm -hmm. So who was Peter Chazot? And... Peter Chazot is one of the uh, uh, French colonists who wrote about his experiences uh, during the Haitian Revolution. Uh, eventually, uh, he published his account. He uh, settled in the southern United States after the Haitian Revolution. And in 1840, he published his account of what he had experienced as a warning to white Southerners about what would happen if they didn't stop the uh, abolition movement in the United States. So uh, it's an, an example of the uh, connection between the Haitian Revolution and uh, events in our own country before the Civil War. Where in the southern United States did he settle? You know, I'm trying to uh, remember that. I think if I remember correctly, uh, he tries to uh, grow coffee in Florida, which didn't work out. I don't remember where he finally wound up settling. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say, it's been a number of years since I did this book, and uh, I'm getting older, and some of the details have faded in my memory. Mm -hmm. I understand that he encountered Toussaint Louverture, the embodiment of what becomes known as the Haitian Revolution, but he was not very impressed or kind towards him. Uh, he felt that uh, Toussaint Louverture was uh, 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 more or less uh, playing games with the white planters who had uh, remained in Saint-Domingue uh, and that uh, uh, he wasn't being uh, straightforward with them about what Toussaint's intentions were. Uh, that was a common impression by the whites who dealt with uh, Toussaint during this period. Uh, Toussaint was a very uh, skilled uh, politician and very good at keeping his own intentions uh, secret. And uh, people who met him uh, never had the feeling that they really knew what uh, he had in mind. What was the role of the clergy and the priesthood between 1791 and 1804? Uh, in the early stages of the Haitian Revolution, some of the uh, white priests, and they were all white at the time, uh, stayed in the territories that uh, were occupied by the black insurgents, and that made them uh, very suspect to the other whites uh, who wondered what they were doing, uh, keeping up contacts with the blacks. In my book, I included a, uh, uh, an excerpt from the testimony of one of these uh, white priests. Among other things, one thing that it made clear uh, was that uh, this priest had a uh, black woman uh, that he lived with, and uh, he was uh, worried about what was going to happen to her. 
And that gave me some insights into the complexities of the relationship between uh, people of different races during the Haitian Revolution. Uh, by the later years of the revolution, there were very few uh, clergy left, and uh, they didn't play a major role in the insurrection. Who was Dessalines, and how was he viewed in the United States? Uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines uh, was originally uh, one of the officers uh, associated with uh, Toussaint Louverture. Uh, he rose to become uh, Toussaint Louverture's right-hand man, uh, fighting in many campaigns under uh, Toussaint's direction. And then after uh, Toussaint Louverture was captured and uh, taken back to France by the French in 1802, Dessalines emerges as the leader of the uh, Haitian forces that successfully fought the French and uh, declared Haiti's independence at uh, the end of 1803. In Haiti, he's seen as a much more important uh, figure uh, really, even than Toussaint Louverture, uh, Toussaint is frequently referred to as the precursor and uh, Dessalines as the liberator. In the United States and the rest of the Western world, however, uh, there was more sympathy for Toussaint Louverture, who was seen as a kind of uh, tragic victim after he died in prison under Napoleon. And uh, Dessalines was seen as a, uh, a, uh, a very uh, bloodthirsty and violent uh, leader uh, who uh, really had a very negative reputation in the rest of the world. So Dessalines was viewed negatively by those who ruled the United States of America? Very much so, yes. And why was that? Well, one thing certainly was the fact that uh, he did order the massacre of most of the uh, whites who remained in the island after the Declaration of Haitian independence, and in my book at the end there are uh, a couple of accounts by some of the few uh, survivors of those massacres. The uh, Haitian historians of the 19th century uh, who wrote uh, the first uh, serious histories of the Haitian Revolution uh, always pointed out that uh, these massacres had really uh, damaged uh, the reputation of Haiti in the world and uh, that uh, they had not served any uh, rational purpose. And uh, that, uh, I think, indicates that there have been some critical perspectives on Dessalines, even in Haiti itself. But as I say, today he really is considered as the uh, great hero of the Haitian Revolution, more so than Toussaint Louverture. Speaking of historians of the Haitian Revolution, you mentioned the Trinidadian-born writer C.L.R. James, who in 1938 publishes a book, Black Jacobins, about the revolution. How do you evaluate his book? His book was a uh, really a um, great moment in the uh, writing about the Haitian Revolution. Uh, it became by far the most widely read account in the English-speaking world. And I remember encountering it as a uh, student in uh, the 1960s. Uh, it was part of the uh, radical literature that uh, uh, many of us were reading at the time. Uh, however, uh, James was, uh, well, he was a very important intellectual and a journalist. Uh, he was not a uh, trained historian, and I would say the more recent books in the uh, last 20 years when uh, many very uh, talented uh, professional historians have written about this subject have led us to revise uh, some of our some of the judgments that James made but it's still a, a great classic in the literature of uh, anti-colonialism and uh, of the uh, development of black consciousness who was William Wilberforce and how do you assess Shazuk's idea that he encouraged what we call Haitians to retaliate against the French. Uh, William Wilberforce was one of the leaders of the uh, British movement to abolish the slave trade uh, during this period. Uh, he played an important role in uh, uh, developing opposition to uh, the slave trade in England. Uh, the claim made by Chazot and uh, some of the other French that uh, Wilberforce and other British abolitionists uh, had incited the Haitian Revolution, and in particular that they had incited uh, 
deaths I mean to order the uh, killing of the whites in Haiti has no foundation at all. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, moving documents that I've found over the years in my research are the letters from uh, the British representative in Haiti at the moment of those massacres uh, talking about how he had done everything possible first to persuade Dessalines not to go ahead with them and uh, secondly to save as many uh, of the lives of the victims as he could. I think it makes it clear that the British uh, did whatever they could, although they weren't successful, to try to uh, oppose those massacres. Now, you mentioned in passing the impact of what we call the Haitian Revolution in the United States. How would you sum up the impact of these events between 1791 and 1804, not only in the United States, but in the hemisphere? They really, uh, ha it really had two contradictory effects. Uh, there's no doubt that it inspired uh, movements of black resistance and attempts at uh, slave rebellion, uh, such as uh, Gabriel's Rebellion in Virginia and uh, the uh, Denmark and Daisy conspiracy in South Carolina, as well as movements in uh, other parts of the Americas and uh, the Caribbean. Uh, so it definitely uh, served as an inspiration to movements for black freedom. On the other hand, it served whites as a uh, argument for uh, strengthening uh, and uh, toughening their controls over their um, enslaved black labor force. Uh, they could point to the uh, violence of the Haitian Revolution and say, uh, this is what will happen if we're not constantly on our guard and uh, constantly keeping uh, the blacks under control. Uh, and it uh, certainly contributed to the uh, rise of a new and more virulent kind of uh, racism throughout the Western world in the 19th century with uh, theories that uh, blacks were a separate uh, species uh, that uh, were not part of the uh, same human race as whites and the other arguments for uh, racial hierarchy. So uh, its impact was really very mixed, I would say. There's a well-known book published of late entitled Silencing the Past, which alleges that uh, at least in the 20th century, and perhaps even in this century, there's been a downplaying of the significance of the Haitian Revolution, perhaps I should say the 19th century. Uh, no, I, I, I think uh, Trio is right that this goes well into the 20th century as well. Mm -hmm. But given your book, Professor Popkin, Facing Racial Revolution, uh, there seem not necessarily to be a downplaying of the significance of what we call the Asian Revolution as it was unfolding. It appears to have received significant coverage, as you suggested. It seemed to have a contradictory impact, helping to inspire the enslaved to resist and inspiring enslavers to dig in their heels. So this downplaying appears to arise after 1804, and if so, why? Uh, before uh, the end of the um, Haitian struggle for independence, uh, the uh, events uh, there were certainly uh, uh, headline news throughout uh, the uh, Western world. Uh, they're in all the newspapers. They were debated in uh, uh, parliamentary assemblies in France, in uh, the United States, and elsewhere. Uh, they were a major preoccupation for people like uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, other American leaders at the time, and uh, for Napoleon and other French leaders. After uh, Haiti uh, becomes independent, though, uh, it uh, ceases to play a major role in uh, world affairs. And uh, in the, for the whites, uh, particularly in France, this memory was a humiliating one uh, that uh, these uh, Blacks had defeated Napoleon's best troops and that France had lost its uh, most valuable colony. These were things people didn't really want to talk about. And uh, I would say that that, uh, prevailed, that attitude prevailed for nearly uh, two centuries. But uh, starting around uh, 1990, there has been a, a big upsurge of interest in the events of the Haitian Revolution. 
and uh, I'm happy to have contributed to it in my own small way, but I'm not the only uh, historian who has done that. And we now can see that this is one of the great movements for freedom and the equality, along with the American and French revolutions of the period. Uh, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, listeners who are interested in the subject uh, will uh, explore many of the, some of the many excellent books that have been published about it in the last 30 years. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Jeremy D. Popkin, William T. Bryan, Chair in History at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, and editor and author of the book, Facing Racial Revolution, Eyewitness Accounts of the Haitian Insurrection. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Popkin. Well, thank you for contacting me, and it's been a uh, pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thanks again to Professor Jeremy D. Popkin for coming in to share his hard-earned knowledge with us. We now take you to another prison radio relay, coming at you with a message from our brother Ken Juan Congo Jr., followed by a message from our home, KPFK 90.7 FM. My inmate number is ND7568, and the title of this piece is Queen Elizabeth II and Imperialism. This is Ken Wanda Congo Jr. calling from a prison camp behind enemy lines. I have allies who are crying over the death of Queen Elizabeth II, crying, literal tears. All human life is sacred. I will allow allies to grieve. Now that the final funeral for Queen Elizabeth II is over, it is time to evaluate and continue our struggle for liberation. I want to discuss the British Empire under the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. I want us to draw on this history in order to better our present and enhance our future. The reign of Queen Elizabeth II is filled with violent upheaval or decolonization. Though, for some reason, this bloody history is obscured. During her reign, we witnessed the separation of nearly the entire British Empire into 50 independent states. The age of Queen Elizabeth II claims that its origin is in the concept of British rule as a form of educating its colonies and self-government. But, in reality, the objective was to preserve Britain's international influence. Thus, government was a lie, and the truth was violent oppression. The colonial governor of Malaya declared a state of emergency to fight guerrillas, and the British troops used counterinsurgency tactics. The governor of Kenya imposed a state of emergency to suppress an anti-colonial movement known as Mau Mau, under which the British colonial power rounded up tens of thousands of Kenyans into detention camps and subjected them to brutal, systematic torture in Cyprus and Yemen. British governors again declared states of emergency to contend with anti-colonial uprisings, and again they tortured civilians. Nearly every year until the 2000s, the empire tortured Commonwealth colonies. Our champion multiculturalism to Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, the empire also supported the U.S.-led invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. Inequality continued to widen. The royal family split over Harry's and Meghan's accusation of racism, and London became a haven for the super-rich oligarchs. During the last decade of her reign, the Queen watched Britain come to terms with its new position. Public pressure began to build against the state to acknowledge its horrific history of colonial violence. In 2013, the British government agreed to pay nearly 20 million pounds to the torture victims of colonial Kenya. In 2019, the government made another payout to Cyprus survivors. See, other colonial territories can follow the example of many others, including Barbados, 
who left its colonial past to become a republic in 2021. Maybe we can have a new campaign for Scottish independence, even though the Queen was against this as well. Oh, we can look at the obscured history in new light to learn from the empirical past and continue our struggle for world liberation. This is Kenwan Congo Jr. calling from a prison camp behind enemy lines. Thank you. All power to the people. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. Welcome back here to Freedom Now. It is now time for more diasporic breakdowns with Dr. Gerald Horn, who's now being joined by Professor Quito Swan. Take it away, Dr. Horn. This is Gerald Horn for KPFK, KPFK kpfk.org. And with me on the line is Professor Quito Swan, Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies at Indiana University in Bloomington, and the author of the book, Pacifica Black, Oceania Anti Anti-Colonialism in the African World. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Swan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Horn, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And we're excited to have you. So why did you write this book, Pacifica Black? Well, I was writing a book about the global dynamics of black power uh, through the life of an activist from Bermuda named Paolo Camarcafego, who was highly involved in black power in Australia, uh, Wanawatu, and involved in movements for environmental justice in places like Papua New Guinea and Fiji. Uh, so I basically was, you know, conducting research on, on his life activism in the 60s, 70s. And while I was in the region, obviously I spoke with you first about where I should go in terms of doing research in Oceania. And I was just struck by the intensity of, of, of Black movements uh, in the region. And I thought it would be appropriate to write a full length book um, about how movements for liberation and self-determination in Melanesia reached out to the broader Black world as a form of Black internationalism in their own struggles against uh, European colonialism and their own fight for, for decolonization and self-determination. So your book concerns, among other things, the indigenous people of Australia, mm -hmm. the indigenous people of Papua New Guinea and West Papua, and their struggle with the Indonesians Yes. And the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and the indigenous people, they resemble people from the African continent mm -hmm. in terms of their melanin content as embodied in the descriptor Melanesian. And I recall when I was doing research in Fiji, which is part of this geographic region, I was told that the indigenous language of Fiji linguistically is similar to certain East African languages, which raises the inference that uh, there were these geographic and other connections millennia ago between mm -hmm. Fijians and the East Africans. I understand that some of the people in Melan Melanesia object to that kind of characterization. Uh, 
how, how do you respond to the connection between that region and the Melanesians and Africa? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, my work is broadly um, centered in the, the 20th century for the most part. Uh, but you can't help but ignore exactly what, what you just said. Uh, Melanesia itself refers to some 14 million persons, 2,000 islands, some 1,300 languages. Uh, as you mentioned, of course, Wanawatu, PNG, the Solomons, West Papua, Fiji, and New Caledonia. And it's a massive region. Um, what anthropologists have done and, and archaeologists, they have traced what they call the spreading of Lapita culture, which is a, a type of pottery uh, that they've traced across the region um, that dates back several thousand years, uh, that speaks to some of these migration patterns. But there are several waves. Uh, there are earlier waves uh, in which indigenous persons of Australia literally walked from Papua New Guinea into Australia because there wasn't water yet um, between you know those, those two regions. But anthropologists have done DNA work that suggests that those inhabitants of Australia match the DNA of the first uh, individuals who left Africa via West Africa. Uh, there's also some connection between what's been called Australasian languages and Malagasy. Uh, so it seems like there may have also been uh, some sense of the earlier diasporas. Um, some of this is out of my purview, but I also met communities in Fiji that were adamant that their ancestors came from Tanganyika, including a community known as First Landing. Um, but a lot of work is being done, I would say also by indigenous archaeologists. Uh, there's a strong community of archaeologists in Wanawatu who are doing this kind of work uh, that have traced, um, you know, some of these migration patterns across Asia before heading south, uh, close to Taiwan via Papua New Guinea. But I, I think it's just fascinating. Um, my work also was centered on black communities who actively identify as being black. And I think that's a critical mass across the region. Now, speaking of that latter point, there have been historic ties between Melanesians and black Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about that in terms of World War II, in terms of Black Panther Party formations, et cetera. Yeah, uh, you know, once again, you know, there, there are waves. Um, there are these fascinating, fascinating waves. In the, the, the one of my chapters in the book is focused on West Papua, which shares an island with Papua New Guinea. It's, it's the western side of the island, similar to a Haiti Dominican Republic. Um, it was colonized by the Dutch after World War II. It was given to Indonesia via a deal brokered by uh, the Kennedy administration, also fortified by the Bang Down Conference, um, which is a you know critical moment that raises questions about um, how all colonizers on from Europe, so to speak. Uh, West Papuans were adamant that they were Melanesian. They identified with. Uh, other black communities in the, in the region and they reached out to several activists in the United States. Uh, they sent several articles to black newspapers, African American newspapers, asking for support. Uh, the materials used vernacular like Negro of the Pacific uh, to black to the world. And they got support from the NAACP, um, a number of individuals uh, like Angela Gilliam, who was a black feminist anthropologist. But ironically, or well, actually ironically, but strikingly, they still remain a colony of, of West Papua. I mean, sorry, of Indonesia. Um, and it's not uncommon to see, you know, posts online from activists in West Papua who are still seeking support. Uh, but it just, it's a broad range. So in the book, I talk a lot about the Black Power Movement, how it emerges in Papua New Guinea 
particularly the students at the University of Papua New Guinea who were in the 1960s are reading the work of Malcolm X, the reading of Fanon, um, the engaging these thinkers, there are connections with, as you mentioned, the Australian uh, Black Panther Party, which was founded in 1972, and also there's a Polynesian Panther Party founded in New Zealand in 1970. Uh, so these these connections to me were really, really rich. Um, and these Black movements also sought to address the Pacific concerns of the region. Uh, you know, a lot of times Black power globally is denounced as mimicking other movements. I think that's really unfair. Uh, these movements definitely learned from other struggles, but they were also were applying black power to the unique struggles. Mm -hmm. Now, Libya, under mm. Colonel Gaddafi, toppled yes. in 2011 by a U.S. and NATO intervention, uh, extended solidarity to the region. And could you talk about that? And I'm curious if you have any speculation as to how that might have outraged the North Atlantic powers. Yeah, uh, this is a, another fascinating, um, you know, moment that I didn't start the book thinking about. Uh, but in 1987, uh, Gaddafi hosts some 300 delegates from over 60 liberation struggles across Oceania and East Asia at what was termed the Pacific, a Pacific Peace Conference in Tripoli. And basically, you know, he, 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 he gave a vision of a, of a, of a world, a one single front against U.S., British, and French imperialism in Oceania that would stretch across the Pacific and the Atlantic. So, for example, he linked the indigenous struggles of Wanawatu, Australia, New Zealand, New Caledonia, which is still a French colony, and Hawaii to the other Libya, Grenada, and Nicaragua. He argued that peoples of Oceania, Central and Latin America, Africa and Asia shared a common destiny, that they were targets of imperialism because they were of color, they were black, they were poor, all small in number and land mass. Uh, but this is this was just not, you know, Gaddafi, you know, spouting uh, political poetics. Uh, liberation leaders from Wanawatu actively saw themselves as a Cuba of Oceania, they saw themselves as a Ghana of Oceania, and in their path to independence, they attended the Sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania. Uh, they sought to build communities with Black liberation struggles at the UN, uh, through church networks like the World Council of Churches. And so this was part for the course in terms of how they reached out to Africa and, and liberation leaders. I mentioned West Papua. West Papua was actually given uh, support by Leopold Senghor in the mid 1970s so there are these other connections but the libya connection is, is critical uh wanawatu was colonized by the french and the british and so in their vision of black internationalism they saw themselves as not just being anglophone but being connected to black francophone struggles they go independent in 1980 but the sister struggles like in new caledonia which they sought to support and so in going to libya they sought to get support uh, from Gaddafi for the other struggles that were still fighting for independence uh, to get support for. And so they received training uh, in a variety of measures. Uh, Gaddafi extended a ton of support across the region and he's very much attacked. Libya's attacked. Wanawatu was attacked publicly by the, the leaders of Australia and New Zealand and the United States and France. And to the credit, uh, one and watch took a stand and said we're an independent country, we're no longer a colony. We will make alliances with, you know, who we choose. Uh, they denounced the U.S. bombing of Libya. They denounced the U.S. invasion of, of Grenada. And they sought to further these relationships with the black radical, or I should say the radical global south. But it, it's a fascinating, I thought it was a really fascinating moment of solidarity. Uh, between Africa and Oceania that I think has not really been parallel, um, you know, in, in, in my humble opinion. Mm. Now, speaking of Vanuatu, talk to us about Robert Van Lurup. Mm. Another fascinating moment. <laughs> uh, Robert Van Lurup, as you know, uh, of Suriname's descent, was a, a major lawyer in New York. He made the amazing 
pioneering documentary, A Luta Continua, which was based upon uh, Southern African liberation struggles, particularly in Mozambique and, and, and Guinea-Bissau. Uh, because of his connection with these revolutionary movements and his position as a lawyer, when Wanawatu went independent, they saw the services as their ambassador um, to the United Nations. And so he became a really critical um, conduit and a critical voice of Wanawatu at the UN, also in Harlem, which they established a mission in Harlem. Uh, he played a critical role in the support of, of New Caledonia. Uh, Wanawatu also saw itself as actively being taken a charge in the nuclear free independent Pacific movement. And so they, they framed a, a black internationalist uh, foreign policy based on environmental justice. So Van Lirup at the UN, he really stood in and, and wore a number of different hats. Uh, for example, he represented Wanawatu at international meetings of the Alliance of Small Island States, uh, the Global Conferences on Sustainable Development of Small Island States. He led delegations to Burkina Faso in 1988, Nicaragua, uh, the South Pacific Forum on behalf of Wanawatu. And so, you know, I think this is just an amazing moment of, of solid, an extended moment, I would say, of solidarity that spans across the 1980s and for me asks us to think beyond the typical framing of, of, of black internationalism or uh, solidarity you know around the atlantic world and a world marked by the 1970s there's a ton of uh you know trafficking of, of revolutionary ideas and radical politics between oceania and the americas that van lira represents in the 1980s and 90s I should also mention that the feminist anthropologist that you mentioned a moment or two ago, Angela Gilliam, mm -hmm. was my neighbor in the 1980s. Wow. Harlem, on 147th Street in St. Nicholas. And of course, wow. Van Lira lived around the corner at 148th in St. Nicholas. <laughs> and uh, listeners to Freedom Now might recall we interviewed Van Lira uh, some months ago. You can probably still find mm. that online. But it wasn't just Black Americans who were in solidarity with the South Seas or West mm. Africans. You mentioned Leopold Senghor, the founding father of modern Senegal, uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, Woli Sonyenka, Chiwana Achebe. Yes. Talk to us about West African solidarity with the region. Yeah, I, uh, so, you know, Senghor was an ardent supporter of, of, of West Papua, and also it's Melanesian neighbor, uh, East Timor. Uh, circa 1975, as I mentioned, he allowed um, the, re the revolutionary provisional government of West Papua to establish a, a base um, in Dakar. And this was a, this was a critical, uh, excuse me, this was a critical moment because it's the mid 1970s and what what the provisional government was able to do was to take advantage of the, the, the traffic of black activists, scholars, artists who were traveling via, through the car for a number of meetings. So, for example, Willis and Yinka, he organized a, a black writers, a major black writers conference in Senegal in the mid 1970s, uh, well, actually 1976. And one of the one of the leaders of West Papua attended that meeting and he presented before the uh, you know attendants like Sheikh Anta Jop, uh CLI James is present, uh Brazil's Abdiota Nascimento is present as well, Guinea's Kamara Lai, um Soyinka, Sudan's Tabano Yoling, who actually taught at the University of Papua New Guinea about negritude. Uh Haki Madbuti is present, Harold Cruz, uh the Carruthers. Um, and even, you know, Carlos Moore is at, is at this meeting. But this produced a really amazing document called the Declaration of Black Intellectuals and Scholars in Support of the People Struggle of West Papua New Guinea and East Timor against Indonesian colonialism. Uh, they call for support from black thinkers, scholars from Africa, North America, South America, the Caribbean. And, you know, I think what also is, is striking is when we think about places like Paris as a site of Black internationalism, Chicken Jop is actively forging relationships with 
uh, liberation leaders from New Caledonia, who were also present in Paris, uh, the reading for Nan. And I, you know, for me, this was fascinating to see a place like Dakar also as a, as a hub of black internationalism um, in the mid 1970s, but also connected to these other linkages um, that, you know, would include, for example, East Timor, which was colonized by the Portuguese, establishing or getting support from Mozambique and Frelimo. You know, there are still some unanswered questions in terms of Africa, uh, West Africa and East Africa in terms of its support of oceanic liberation struggles. Mm. Now, another similarity between uh, Africans in the Western Hemisphere and the Americas and the indigenous people of the South Seas is exploitation in terms of cheap and free labor. In yes. that context, talk to us about blackbirding. Well, <laughs> I, I must I must admit, um, Dr. Horn, that your, your book, The White Pacific, uh, is, is in my humble opinion one of the strongest reads on blackbirding. Um, so you know, it was you once again who pointed me towards sources in the in the region. Uh, but blackbirding is is basically in the 19th century with the forced labor trade in which uh, European traders, Australian traders, forcibly took uh, indigenous communities from Melanesia, largely around Wanawatu, or today's Wanawatu, to work in sugar and cotton plantations in Australia, as well as Fiji. Uh, there were communities from Tahiti and quote unquote French Polynesia, also taken to the Andes um, as well. And, you know, this, this actually created another community in Australia known as the South Sea Islanders. When Australia goes independent uh, circa 1901, it was established around the constitution established the white Australia policy. And so they deported tons or hundreds, I should say thousands really of folks they have forcibly uh, taken to Australia. I was also struck by in, in, in the black power era, some of the descendants of those communities who were blackbirded were very vocal members like Patricia Corowa. Uh, there were civil rights struggle leaders um, as well, who was like Faith Bandler who was told stories by her father who was blackbirded but he was forced to be taking uh these are really visceral memories um i, I would just end this by saying uh, paul robinson makes a tour of australia in the 1960s and faith bandler talked a lot with, with the robinson say as london was also present about blackbirding about the treatment of indigenous australians um it, it, she connected this to slavery and there are these other other narratives of slavery as well. Um, as, as your work, you, you spill out how some of these ships were actually used in the Atlantic slave trade um, and how a number of Southern Confederates literally changed their operations from uh, the U.S. South uh, to Australia af after the Civil War. Um, I think this also influences thinkers, Black thinkers of the world in the late 19th century, people like W.B. Du Bois, who at the first pan African Congress, they talk about the South Seas. Uh, so there's also this, this knowledge of this exploitation among African-Americans, other black thinkers as well, that I think, you know, we, we need to do also do some more, more mining um, in terms of, of how the architects of Pan-Africanism and black internationalism also included Oceania in the global renderings around race. Finally, Professor Keto Swan, Professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies at Indiana University in Bloomington, author of the book Pacifica Black, Oceania and Anticolonialism in the African World. What's next? What do your readers have to look forward to from Professor Swan? Well, uh, Doc, similar to your work, um, you know, I have a ton of interest. Uh, you know, I'm trying to be as global as, as, as possible. Uh, my lens or my, my lane is, is very much black internationalism. Uh, I do have another project on, on the Pacific, uh, but right now I'm, I'm working on a, a book that looks at uh, reggae music, sound system culture, and dance all in the 1980s and 90s and, and, and black internationalism. So I'm looking at, um, you know, we, we don't have to make the argument that reggae of Bob Marley was, was political. 
but we might have to push, you know, uh, push the conversation a little further when we talk about sound systems in the 1980s. But I'm doing my project is looking at how sound systems recorded uh, really critical moments of crisis and also promise in the black world. For example, the assassination of Walter Rodney, uh, the invasion of Grenada, uh, police brutality, Ethiopia. Uh, how all these these narratives are really important to the black world and are documented and archived by these sound systems, sometimes intentionally and sometimes very very unintentionally so that's that's the that's the next immediate immediate work right on so i'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there professor swan professor of african and african american african american african diaspora studies at indiana university at bloomington author of the book pacifica black oceania anti-colonialism in the african world thank you for joining us on freedom now kpfk los angeles thank you sir and i'll be happy to come by anytime right on you'll find black people uh, in America as they strive to throw off the shackles of of uh, mental colonialism will also probably reflect uh, uh, an effort to show to, to uh, throw off the shackles of uh, cultural colonialism and they may begin to reflect desires of their own with standards of their own in closing we'd like to thank our guest professor Jeremy D Popkin from the University of Kentucky at Lexington. Find yourself a Black-owned bookstore near you today and grab his book, Facing Racial Revolution, Eyewitness Accounts of the Haitian Insurrection. Also, thank you to Professor Quito Swan at the University of Indiana at Bloomington for joining us on the show this morning. And while you are in that bookstore you know and love, why not grab his book, Pacifica Black, Oceana, anti-colonialism and the African world. Shout out to Professor Dr. Gerald Horn for doing what he does best and guiding this train of mental liberation towards Pan-African enlightenment for yet another Saturday. Hit up your favorite bookstore right now and find one of Dr. Horn's many informative texts to enrich your library and your mind. Many thanks to Prison Radio. Baba Mumia Abu Jamal and Brother Kenwan Congo Jr. for keeping us in the know from outside the walls of injustice. Word to producer Sister Tej. Much love to our spiritual backbone, Baba Didan Kamathi. Shout out to our wonderful and marvelous engineer. And last but certainly not least, thanks to all of our loyal listeners and supporters out there. It takes a village to build a revolution and freedom now is a village to be reckoned with. This has been Brother Brandon Sankara and you can join us on Facebook at Freedom Now Gerald Horn. You can email the program at freedomnow at kpfk.org or go to our audio archives at kpfk.org scroll down to freedom now and you'll be able to hear this program as well as 60 days worth of prior programming here at kpfk 90.7 fm we now send you off to our sister assumpta with spotlight africa coming up next addressing issues facing mama africa and until next saturday here at freedom now we stand running our marathon ready for revolution